Welcome to this week's episode of Sealed for Good and thanks for tuning in. This week marks the start of a brand new series where we look at a very relevant and distressing subject in the industry, waterproofing failures. Our focus will be on internal and external wet areas as these are the applications we commonly see failures and we receive a lot of inquiries about. Each week we'll be covering different topics on the subject including design aspects and how it can affect or influence the installation and increase the potential for failures, installation, workmanship and competence, material suitability, maintenance, consequences of failures, the role of contractors, builders and the consumer can play in reducing the risk and frequency of failures, and the roles and responsibility of the manufacturer and how we go about improving the industry. According to the insurance industry, Waterproofing failure still represents one of the biggest claims in terms of monetary value and the ramifications for waterproofing failures are far reaching and often very costly. But more on that in upcoming episodes. For our first topic we'll be covering design aspects and considerations and how this can impact and create challenges for the waterproofing process. It's the considerations that precede any practical application of the membrane system and getting this right can make a big difference in the end. A good grounding and understanding of the evasive nature of water and its ability to expose even the most minute flaw is essential for both design and installation considerations. It requires an understanding about the way the building works. It's not just the waterproofing compounds themselves, but extends to the substrate and finishes. It's an understanding that a waterproofing membrane is really only as good as the substrate that it's sitting on. It's an understanding of the surrounding materials and finishes that the membrane system should not compensate for poor design. Good design is a suitable waterproofing system should be complementary to ensure the longevity of the waterproofing system and the structure it's there to protect. Good design will effectively minimize the influence of water on a structure. Good design is established on a solid understanding of the minimum requirements within the National Construction Code and the relevant standards. Before we proceed on to specific design elements, we need to preface this by stating that the following examples are certainly not the causes of waterproofing failures, but simply design elements that may create added challenges and stresses on the membrane system that may potentially increase the risk of failure. So let's have a look at these major design aspects. The type of design scenarios that may affect the waterproofing application for internal wet areas include things like open showers next to doorways with wooden architraves. This sort of situation will definitely increase the risk of water getting to those timbers and then warping them. Open showers, steam showers, shower rose types and handheld sprayers, all of these increase the scope of the waterproofing application as water is not contained. The extent of whether waterproofing needs to be applied increases to meet the standard must be considered. Windows in showers, typically these should be avoided but if it is part of the design and it is approved, properly integrating the membrane system onto the window ledges and frames is critical. Shower niches and ledges increase risk by lack of fall generated on the niche and inadequate sealing to joints and junctions. Alternative surface finishes trends including polished concrete and micro cement, how the membrane properly integrates and terminates when used with these finishes is a type of thing that you need to relate back to the waterproofing manufacturer like Ripset and also the manufacturers of those specific products. Is there a special detail as far as base coat components for micro cement? What are the components? Are they compatible with each other? And will the system perform? Showers over baths, ability to properly seal critical edges and interfaces. Baths without shower screens increases the scope of waterproofing and the extent of the membrane must be considered. Alternative substrate types, New introduced substrate types with limited in-service data. Have these been tested and fit for purpose? You know, for example, at Gripset, if we come across a new substrate, the first thing we'll do, send that to the lab and make sure that we've done the specific performance test required to ensure that it is a suitable substrate and we have recommendations ready to go for the application. Um, a lot of the time, new products, the information can often be vague on the recommendations for sealing and waterproofing leaving the waterproofer to then try and construct some sort of system. Large format tiles on floors in showers with central drainage can restrict falls um, if not cut adequately. General surface falls, are the falls adequate to allow for the efficient drainage of water and 
remembering that the new standard does call for membrane to be applied over surfaces with falls. So that brings us to external wet areas. Mainly lightweight balcony structure is where we see the majority of waterproofing failures. For example, timber frame and compressed fiber cement sheeting. Some of the design elements that increase the risk of failures to these areas include balcony layout, so drainage. So we see a lot of centrally located drainage sumps, but if you actually review a lot of these manufacturers installation manuals they clearly reference the drainage to fall away from the building and spill over the edge a lot of the time it's not recommended for central drainage as this increases the potential for water retention falls so poor falls is a major contributor to added stresses on the membrane and tiling system lightweight balcony structures can be constructed with falls but most are built flat relying on screeds to generate these falls Heating loud in construction Sheet layout for direct fixing versus layout for screening, you often see different detail for those type of applications. Um, most of the time, or if not all the time, you always see the screed to be called as an unbonded system, which would then require additional reinforcement. Allowance for movement and expansion joints on larger structures is also a critical consideration that needs to be made during the design phase. Expansion joints installed in the sheet if direct tiling, this needs to be carried through the tiles. Screeding. Inclusion of separating layers between the membranes and screed for unbonded screeds, as mentioned, are to be reinforced and at least to be 40 millimeters thick. Slip sheets allow the screed to move independently to the substrate, giving the membrane system a better chance and also the screed system, reducing the, the chance of cracking um, and warping. Under and over systems. Waterproofing over a screed is not mandatory under AS4654. By not waterproofing over it, will increase the likelihood of water into the screed. This will then increase the risk of efflorescence and also puts added strain on the membrane system. Membrane terminations. Designs that don't allow for proper upward terminations of membranes, for example, designs with no provision for a skirting tile or other coverings, this can limit the vertical termination of the membrane, increasing the risk of failure. Balcony edge detail, drip angles and tile trims installed to draw water away from the substrate are also critical for the longevity of the waterproofing system. Penetrations and fixings. Balustrates, spigots installed over and penetrated the completed membrane should never be the case. Ensure there is a provision for re-waterproofing over the base plates once installed. Have they been installed properly? They must be fixed through the timber substrate, not the structural sheeting. Threshold sealing. Threshold sealing prior to the installation of doors and windows. This is a requirement under the AS4654 standard, but is not always adhered to. And generally, surfaces should be presented that allow for the continuity of the membrane across all surfaces. The membrane system is not designed to bridge or substitute for construction elements, nor hold a structure together. While pre-planning, and design considerations can greatly affect the influence of water on a structure. A successful long-term waterproofing system install remains a shared responsibility between all parties, prim primarily at the concept stage, then a construction, and finally the waterproofing contractor. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Sealed for Good, and we hope to see you on the next one. Until then, happy waterproofing.